Quest video, setting the standard. Hello, peeps. Come and peep in the past. St Helens Peeps in the Past, our heritage, looks briefly at how the town developed from the early 1400s, how the coal and salt industries brought prosperity in the mid-1700s, the glass industry, where and how it began, see the grand opening of Low House Church in 1929, Saints are going to Wembley, 1956, see the crowds again as Alan Prescott lifts the cup, hear about the history of the club while watching Vollenhoven and other Saints legends in action, Policeman directing traffic in town. Helena House, do you remember the blowout? Elsie Tanner and Hilda Ogden are in town. Were you in the watching crowds? Hear about the Beecham story and how he gave his St. Helens workforce the bitter pill. The demise of the glass industry. The closure of Parkside Colliery. The new hope for the town with the opening of the M62 Link Road. All this and much, much more when you peep in the past. Alex Murphy celebrates 40 years. This video witnesses the cheek, the charm, and the colorful career of the extraordinary talent of Alex Murphy. It includes interviews with a host of legendary veterans and a star-spangled cast of after-dinner speakers. He was born a star, really. Alex's many friends and colleagues, past and present, celebrate his illustrious, sometimes turbulent career. Hilarious stories never before made public, told by David Oxley, Ray French, Vince Karelius and Freddie Pye. He says, Freddie, we're going to have to tighten security up, you know, again, at Main Road. I said, why is that? He said, because the bloody players are still getting on the pitch. <laughs> Journalist John Huxley interviews Alan Prescott, David Howes, Sergeant Major Eric Clay, Mick Morgan, Peter Fox, also Eddie Hemmings, rugby league commentator, Sky TV. D-Day, St. Helens remembers. See and hear the chilling stories told by men from St. Helens who fought for freedom. There were bodies everywhere. All floating like sacks of wheat on the tide, in and out, in and out. So many, you could not count them. And he's, all his bread was hanging out. All the yellow matter, yellow and white, hanging out to the town. I had a telegram. July, I think it was, August. Missing the lead killed. I don't know how many got killed on these day, but on the beaches where I was involved, there was hundreds and hundreds of bodies, tanks rolling over bodies. Possibly some were not even dead when they were run over. We don't know. The number of men that were being killed and dying. All, all over the farmyard, they were rushing out of these buildings with, with injuries and such. And nobody could do nothing about it. They were all cringing down where, where we could. And I know I'm me in particular, I never prayed so much in all my life containing footage from the Imperial War Museum, also St. Helens street scenes, including some from the early 40s. This is not just another war film. Turn the clock back. Indulge in how we were when you peep in the past. These videos are available from all leading video stockists, or send a cheque for £12.99 for each video, include your name and address, and receive the video post-free. You'll also receive details of videos available in this series.
This wilderness is part of the M62 corridor, which came into being on October the 27th, 1994, when the new St. Helens Link Road to the motorway network was officially opened by Stephen Norris, MP. Regeneration and development plans for this area have sadly been halted, and the promise of a new multi-screen cinema for St. Helens has been put on ice. It's seen by central government to be an out-of-town development, and they've called in the plans for consideration. There were once as many as 15 cinemas in St. Helens. Today, there are none. It's a century ago since the first moving pictures were shown in Britain. It took, however, several years for the first film to be shown in the town of St. Helens. The Edwardian Music Hall, the Hippodrome in Corporation Street, which was opened on October the 12th, 1903, began to show short films in 1907, between the acts that appeared there. The first purpose-built cinema didn't appear until some eight years later. The ensuing years were to prove that cinema had become a popular place for family entertainment, and by 1939, the Hippodrome became a fully converted cinema until its closure in 1963. The Hippodrome later became a bingo hall, and still is today. By the late 50s, the lodger in the lounge, the television set, was about to replace cinema entertainment. It had become easily affordable to own a television, with advertisements in local newspapers offering newfangled higher purchase and rental schemes. Rothery Radio of Ormskirk Street and Baldwin Street had, for immediate delivery, TV sets at budget prices, with weekly payments ranging from 11 shillings to 13 and 11 pence. Or for cash, you could own a top-of-the-range HMV model with fine-touch tuning in a walnut cabinet for only £69.17 and sixpence. Even cheaper if you went to Radio Rentals at 8 and 4 pence average rental per week. A spokesman for Picture Drones Limited said that attendances have been falling for the last three years and that more cinemas have closed in the northwest than anywhere else in Great Britain. Griffin's Picture Theatre was the first purpose-built picture drome which opened on September the 25th, 1911, and was called the Electric Theatre. Its owner, Alfred Griffin, also owned Griffin's Furnishings next door. Commonly known as Griffin's, the theatre's name was changed to Scala some 23 years later. The picture drome was closed in 1957, and subsequently demolished to make way for Lennon's supermarket. The building is now occupied by Quicksave, and above, a snooker hall, which affectionately retains the name Scala. Within weeks of Griffin's Picture Theatre opening, others soon followed. On October the 12th, 1911, the Pavilion at Jackson Street Par opened, quickly followed by the opening in December of the Picture Drome in Bridge Street, which later became the Savoy. The Pavilion, lovingly known to locals as the Par Dog, was the first cinema in St. Helens to have talking pictures. It remained a cinema for 47 years. The building is now home to glass merchants A.T. Free. By September 1913, St. Helens had added a further six cinemas for the benefit of the ever-increasing population of cinema goers, bringing the total to nine. The Oxford Cinema in Duke Street opened on the afternoon of October the 10th, 1912. Amongst the crowded attendants were many of the town's dignitaries, who were specially invited to witness the opening performance. The Oki, as it was nicknamed, closed in 1956, later becoming the Plaza, which played host to many of today's big names in entertainment, including the Beatles. Um, the Plaza days, when uh, you used to go down, the Beatles were always on, on the Friday, and uh, more often than not, we'd have to give them a shove after the Thames van they used to have, you know, so we were never started, once your battery. And then uh, it's, they went to Cat's Wishes from there, from the plaza, and still did the, the club, but at that time it was a cabaret club, it wasn't a nightclub. And they always fancied buying it. And Eileen Woods at the time was running it as the plaza, as the plaza, and then Cindy's. And then uh, she gave me a ring and told me that. Uh, she was thinking of selling up. 
mother was at the same tested. So I uh, said, yeah, I'd love to. And that's how I come to buy Cindy's. And I bought it with a lad called John Smith, who was now in Warrington, uh, called Mr Smith. But we split up. Uh, it's about seven, eight years ago. And I went on my own and I revamped and called it Lowy's. Lowy's owner, local millionaire businessman Alan Lowe, sold the club in 1996 to Northern Leisure, the present owners. I mean, there was such a buzz Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, obviously, mm. you know, you miss that little side of it, even though it was really hard work, but, um, you know, I'm looking forward to a week in the sunshine this Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Queues are a regular sight at the ever-popular St Helens night spot, a throbbing hive of activity. Plans are soon to be put in operation to completely refurbish Lowy's night spot, taking the club into the 21st century. Perhaps even a new name, or rather an old one? The Plaza? The Empire in Thatto Heath Road spanned 51 years until its closure in 1963. Another empire opened up the year after the Thatto Heath Empire on June the 2nd, 1913, in Junction Lane, Sutton. The 620-seat cinema became known as the Sutton Bug. Admission was a penny if you sat in the red seats, or tuppence to sit in one of the seats among the three back rows which had armrests. The Bug closed in 1957. On the top floor of the cooperative building in Baldwin Street, a cinema was opened on August the 18th, 1913. Admission to the children's matinees, being only a penny, caused the properly built cinema, with its sloping floor and tip-up seats, to always be packed out, as all the kids wanted to go to the aptly named Penny Rush. The cinema closed after only 19 years. Sadly, the beautiful, characterful building was allowed to fall into decay after serving the town for many years as a department store and was demolished in the mid-80s. Wilkinson's is the new resident on the Baldwin Street site. Haydock Conservative Club was once home to the Electroseum, which began showing films on September the 8th, 1913. And only a week later, another cinema opened at the YMCA, the Gymnasium. Casey Brothers Electrical Shop in Boundary Road used to be the Palladium Cinema, and still has, like many of the others, virtually the same facade as when it saw the opening on November the 15th, 1915. The Haydock Picture Drome is now Colin Dealey's car showroom. There were also two cinemas here in the grounds of Rainhill Hospital, which were used by patients and staff. When the hospital closed in September 1990, the vandals moved in and smashed the place to pieces. Even these two huge 35mm projectors couldn't be saved. A mindless thuggery of those who got here first saw to that. Two of the town's much bigger cinemas opened within days of each other. Thursday, October the 3rd, 1929, saw the grand opening of the Capitol Picture House, the largest in St. Helens. The circle could seat 560, with a further 990 in the auditorium. And on the 7th of October, 1929, the Riverley, on the corner of Corporation Street and Hall Street, opened its 1,350-seat Italian-style building. The Riverley didn't last as long as the capital. It closed in 1965 and later became an EMI bingo hall. Still a bingo hall today, the gala is in the ownership of Bass PLC. Surviving only another eight years after the closure of the Riverley, the inevitable happened. Following in the footsteps of its many predecessors, the capital was forced to close in 1973, later becoming JJB Sports, now YMCA and St. Helens Health Promotion. By now, the town had only one surviving public cinema, the Savoy in Bridge Street. Previously known as the Picture Drome, which had been a cinema since 1911, with seating for 520 people, the building then was no more than a long wooden hut and the screen was just a brick wall painted white. Its owner, James Rylance, who also owned the Pavilion, changed the name in 1920 to the Savoy. The wooden hut was demolished on the 30th of June, 1934. A year later, just yards from the original site, the new Savoy, which had taken eight months to build, was opened 
with seating for 1,467. A growing demand to win new and keep existing customers caused a major change when in 1978 the cinema converted to three screens. Disappointingly, this wasn't enough to woo people to the Savoy, and on August the 19th, 1993, the Savoy, now called Cannon, made front-page news in the St. Helens Star newspaper with the headline, Shock Closure. The 14 staff have been served with redundancy notices, and the last films to be shown are St. Ivor, Jurassic Park, and Made in America. The film-loving folk in St. Helens had the final curtain dropped on their big screen entertainment on Wednesday the 14th of September, 1993. The cinema's owners, MGM Cannon, couldn't be contacted for comments on the decision. So-called out-of-town development regulations are causing St. Helens to remain a town without a cinema. With a distance of only several tenths of a mile from the Chaloncourt Hotel, Ravenhead Renaissance can hardly be called an out-of-town development. Wigan are pressing ahead with their multi-screen virgin cinema and leisure development, which would seem to be more of an out-of-town development, being much more than a mile away from their town centre, much further than the St. Helens scenario. Wigan is also fortunate to have two cinemas that still survive. Warrington has UCI Westbrook multi-screen cinema. Liverpool has several. Greenbank Development, the developers for Ravenhead Renaissance Leisure, will have to wait for the government's decision, as will the big screen goers of St. Helens, who at present have to travel or go without. Someone else who had to travel were CBS Television from America. They came here to Duke Street, St. Helens, in the mid-80s, not to see a film, but to make one, about a local artist and personality known as the Egg and Sausage Artist, who was to feature in an American television program about eccentrics. Well, I've always wanted to become famous, and I was a portrait painter, but uh, I didn't seem to get anywhere. And I decided one day I'd just have a blank canvas and just paint an egg in the middle. And I put that in my window, and everybody came to see it, and that's how things progressed just painting eggs on blank canvases and then it materialised into sausages and then eggs and sausages and so on and so forth. And I seem to have made just a little bit of a dent here in St. Helens. My husband uh, is a very talented artist and um, he painted for many years and we have, we've managed to get this shop in the YMCA buildings which had huge windows in it. Um, and he did a lot of portraits portraits of the mayors that were at that time and even one of Prince Charles and lots of lovely landscapes and people just didn't look at them. He used to have them in the window and there was only odd ones who'd look at them and he got really frustrated about this and one day he suddenly had this idea and um, he painted just one egg in the middle of a huge blank canvas and um, Everybody started looking and the, the, after that he just went on painting eggs and then they led on to eggs and sausages and various other things and he had crowds around the window all the time and this went on for some years um, and then he decided not to sell them for money but for food and I, I didn't believe anybody would actually do this but the first day he had them in for a um, couple of pounds of bacon uh, a lady came just after nine o'clock in the morning with her bacon. Uh, then they were bringing chickens and uh, eggs and sausages, all sorts of things. And they seemed really happy to bargain and barter with them. Uh, he also went on to um, sell them for kisses and tickles. And this was quite funny really because the ladies really wanted these paintings, but it took an awful lot of effort to come in. Sometimes it was for 20 kisses and 10 tickles. But the whole thing was that at the end of the day, my husband didn't actually receive the kisses and tickles. He told them that they'd been brave enough to come in so they could have the painting for nothing. So they went away very happy, having come in shaking like a leaf. Uh, eventually, it, the pressure with me having a Christian bookshop was a bit too much because the paintings, some of them were very suggestive. And uh, my husband stopped painting the eggs and sausages. I won't be doing any more eggs and sausages now. Uh, I'm completely occupied helping my wife here in the Christian bookshop and uh, working and trying to promote God and his son here in St. Allen's.
Hey, thank you very much for coming to visit the Christian Bookshop here in Duke Street and filming me, the egg and sausage artist. It gives me a great thrill because I've always wanted to become famous and be outstanding like such artists as Rembrandt and Michelangelo uh, to be remembered here in St. Helens. And uh, as I say, thank you very much. While Sheila continues her business at the Christian Bookshop in Duke Street, Graham has moved to his new business premises, the religious shop just doors away. Both shops, selling similar commodities, continue to serve the same God and community, working hand in glove with one another. Hand in glove is a phrase that's ever on the minds of this workforce, who've been perfecting a trade that has historical documentation and evidence as far back as the 14th century BC. Parr Industrial Estate is home to the Bourne Tapscott Glove Factory. Opened in 1949 by the Cooperative Wholesale Society, who owned the factory for 40 years. Over the years, the workforce of 120 has dwindled to 34, the majority of which have been here since they left school. Glove making is a highly skilled craft industry, which has hardly changed since the days of the Egyptian king Tutankhamun. Apart from the electricity, that turns on the machines. To ensure a perfect fit, table cutting is still done the same way as has been taught for as long as records show, using only three tools, being a pair of scissors or shears, a stubbing knife and size stick measure, and the skill of the cutter's hand. The factory was first established to supply CWS shops. Over the years, trends have changed, and so production had to alter and new customers sought. During the 60s, the golfing boom put pressure on demand, and the factory made around 100,000 pairs of golf gloves per year for export to the USA. There are many varied designs, styles, and fashions. The 70s and 80s was the era of thermal fiber gloves made for the Damart Catalog Company, who sponsored the Chris Bonington Everest expedition. The gloves used by them were made here. Later, they were modified for use by the general public. Quietly tucked away here in Par, the glove factory has supplied high fashion gloves to Vogue magazine, precision handcrafted gloves worn by fashion models and celebrities alike. There are usually eight components of a leather glove, palm and back in one piece, thumb, three fourchettes, which are slender pieces of leather that form the sides of the fingers, and three quirks, diamond-shaped pieces inserted at the bottom between the fingers. A rectangular piece of leather called a trank is cut by the cutter into the various components according to the style and size required by the customer. Each piece is then given its own identity number to ensure that when the gloves have completed their journey through the factory, the pieces that were cut from the same trank are all joined together to make a perfect match. Glove making is one of the oldest crafts in recorded history, mentioned in the Doomsday Book. William Shakespeare's father was a glove cutter, and Queen Elizabeth I even banned cheap foreign imports during her reign to help the then ailing industry. Motorsport gloves made here in St. Helens are exported to many parts of the world. Canada, the USA, Australia and Europe, and are made for drivers such as top IndyCar racer Al Unser, Jackie Ix, Brock, and in England, the Simonite twins. During the past six or seven years, students have been helped with their fashion portfolios here. One student from County Durham has begun her own business designing high fashion gloves using salmon skins for accessories. These gloves, cut from a salmon skin, are being made to her design. Most recently, Jim Bishop and his workforce have been working with one of the sponsors of the BT Challenge Yacht Race, Pittards of Yeovil, Europe's largest tannery of glove leather. After nine months of sea trials, Vaughan Tapscott were commissioned to make the gloves and mittens for the 10-month race. Ready for pressing and polishing, these gloves complete the 20-minute journey around the various machines before going to be checked and packed, ready for delivery to the customer. There's a particular landmark in St. Helens that stretches skywards and can be seen from virtually all over the borough. It can even be seen from as far away as Warrington. 
At a height of 276 feet, it stands more than 100 feet taller than Pilkington's head office building. Most of us will probably pass it or see it almost every week. It's been there for over 30 years, but do we know what it is, what it's for, and why it's here? It was constructed by a Yorkshire company, Clayton Sun & Company Limited, and was completed in 1968 as a result of demolition of gas holders on the original town's gasworks site. Due to newfound natural gas, manufactured gas was no longer required. The site of the gasworks is now the retail park. The waterless gas holder, technically referred to as a man, due to the three towns where its inventors lived, Machine Farik, Augsburg and Nuremberg, is unlike the more common type of gas holder, such as the one at Pocket Nook, which rises and falls with the amount of gas inside them. The man gas holder is rigid and doesn't move, but a disc inside floats on the gas and falls and rises as gas flows into and out of the structure, supplying the town with gas through its three feet wide outlet. The construction consists of 22 stanchions in a circle arrangement and has a diameter of 161 feet. It was one of four built about the same time, the others being in Liverpool, Ellesmere Port and Southport. Pimlets. Great, good prize. I'm going there now, actually. Well known in St. Helens and everywhere, aren't they? Pimlets. That's, well, just a nice prize. Oh, about Julie, do you? Oh. Well, they're for my dad, like, you know what I mean? Always been here in St. Helens. Because they, 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 they bake them nice, you know, it's good stuff, eh? Pimlets. Pimlets. They're oh. lovely, we always buy them. Um, it's a pasta shop. Pimlets. It's a local, local bakers, isn't it? Supporters of local rugby league football club rivals Wigan are referred to by Saints fans as pie eaters but could they possibly be eating more pies than the townsfolk of St. Helens, who buy 100,000 pies each week over the counters of the 13 branches of local legendary confectioners and pastry cooks, John Pimblet and Sons Limited. It all began 75 years ago, when Mrs. Mary Pimblet began making pies from our household oven at 52 Liverpool Road. My grandmother, Mrs. Mary Pimblet, um, who was part of the Mercer family, of uh, St. Helens, who were well-known bakers and confectioners, um, opened her own shop and started baking her own pies and confectionery from the uh, back of the premises in a normal household oven. And in the first year, she turned over £3,000. From that seed of success, um, business continued to prosper until her husband, John Pimblet, followed her into the, the uh, business and he'd been a fitter in uh, Pilkington's before that. And in the 1930s, uh, my uncle, uh, Mr. Jack Pimlet, uh, came into the business and was trained in confectionery at uh, Bolton College. In the 1950s, my father, who'd previously been a solicitor, Mr. Kenneth Pimlet, um, joined the company, and um, we, it was then we became a limited company, and became John Pimlet and Sons. And um, it was also the time from the end of the 50s through the 60s that the business actually started to grow and, and develop over the whole of St. Thomas. The bakery is a thriving hive of activity from as early as six in the morning, much the same as in the early days at Liverpool Road, where the success story began. The, the whole of the business uh, from, from its uh, inception, though, was based on uh, buying good quality ingredients and making sure that everything that we made was um, 
something which we were all, uh, the whole family were happy with and, and there were things that they all liked and wanted other people to try. <clears throat> so all the recipes of the uh, pies and confectionery uh, which we started with in 1921 are still used today. So the, the, certainly the steak pies and the meat and potato pies which were the uh, front runners in 1921 and still are the front runners today in 1996 are made. Uh, in exactly the same way to the same recipe, just in much larger quantities. And again with vanilla slices and custard, which uh, are uh, renowned throughout the town as well, they're still made with uh, fresh eggs and sugar um, and, uh, and still made to the exact same recipe. Even this mixing bowl is reassuringly similar to that of John's grandmother, Mary Pimlet. The only significant difference is the automation necessary to supply the ever-increasing demand for us pie-eaters. Someone else celebrating a 75th birthday anniversary are St Andrew's Scouts, and they've even got a celebration cake, though not a Pimblet's one. It's been specially made by Scout Leader's daughter, Rebecca Smee. Scouting, which began as an experiment in 1907, when Robert Baden-Powell ran a successful camp for 20 boys from different backgrounds, started here in 1921, and today the troop is as strong as it was 75 years ago. Probably the most dramatic evidence of the changing face of St Helens, with its multi-million pound central redevelopment scheme in the mid-70s, was in the market area. By January 1975, the town, which had had a weekly market since 1780, had not one, but three markets, one at Earlstown and two in Old St Helens. St. Mary's Market opened in October 1972, and work on the Tontine Market was at such a stage that trading could begin in January 1975. There's a bright future for shoppers, said Councillor Gerald Baxter, chairman of the market subcommittee. There's been a big demand for stalls, he continued. The entire market area is steeped in history. When Market Street was constructed in about 1800, a site was left at its junction with Church Street for market traders. Women would stand with baskets containing farm produce for sale. There was a stout form at this junction where they would sit or place their baskets. In 1843 to 44, the winter was so severe it caused the Society of Friends with their accustomed regard for their fellow men to build two wooden sheds along the length of the square so that traders could shelter. The area eventually became the Market Hall in 1870. By the late 1880s, the Covered Market was formed. Mention the word market, and most people will automatically think of noise, colour, friendliness and bustle, and the chance to pick up a bargain. Even if the place was cold and draughty, it had character. Even if the stalls were old and worn, the old market had an atmosphere all of its own. But what surprised me was that they, dis the, they didn't have an outside market again, as well as this, to complement this one. They should have, in my opinion, should have kept an outside market. Then they did try one a few years ago at the college. You know, you know what I mean, at the college, we tried it, but it was just off the beaten track, and it didn't take. Now, if they'd made an outside market, say, right outside here, on this, uh, delivery place there, it would have been ideal, it would have attracted people. Because, you know, and you'll find that a lot of councils are looking for markets to attract people in, aren't they? But if they were in the street or adjacent to the market, it'd be great. I still get customers that, I still get customers that bring a lot of atmosphere to my stall, because they talk about those times, they're brilliant. But, uh, no, it's not the same as the open market, no. It was only three-day trading, so people used to sort of, I've got to go down to the market to get me fruit and veg. We don't have a fruit and veg stall on this market now. There isn't any survived. They've all been taken over by the supermarkets with the cheap, with the fruit and veg, being able to pick their own. So we've lost that atmosphere where all the fruit and veg used to be, you know, sort of everybody shouting, shouting the wares, if you would. We don't get anybody shouting the wares. We're not allowed to shout our wares now, where they could shout, you know, sixpence a pound, get your grapes here. And, and that was sort of 
the outside market. And I think when the older people say we miss the outside market, I don't think it's missing the bargains. It's just missing the atmosphere. They don't have the atmosphere that that one did. And there are still characters around, as there were years ago. Um, in fact, a lot of my customers, my mother served them when they were probably my age. So we, we go back a long way. Mm. Uh, I'd run errands, bring cups of tea, go for lunch. Lunch being what? A piece of toast, a sandwich? Um, yes, I'd, I'd chat to other traders and generally make a nuisance of myself, I suppose. Thank you. First started in uh, Lugs Moor Lane, sausages, bacon, and then we came in here in 75. We had a few shops and ended up just having this one, keeping this one. The old market is where the multi-storey car park is now. And we had uh, concrete stalls with roofs on. Oh, a typical open market, of course it was, yeah. Bit of a wind trap over there though. When it winded, all the bloody rain blew in and everything, you know. But uh, uh, I quite enjoyed it actually. Markets were at the peak then. They had an art of setting all their apples on a nice slant and everything looking good. I know they used to set one or two from the back that was sort of bruised and damaged, and I don't think that did the, the fruit market any good. Over the years, people have got shrewder. They like to say, I can pick my own apples in the supermarket, I can pick my own oranges. If I get a bad one when I get home, I've only got myself to blame. They pay more for it, but it is better. It is better. Uh, but as I say, it's, it's gone. They'll never come back. It was more cosy. OK, being in here, it's warm, ventilated, goodness knows what. But the camaraderie, of the people has been lost somewhere along the line. Maybe life is just harder in general. Maybe it's the same in other places. It was more, I don't quite know how to explain, but perhaps more family orientated. The market superintendent would come around. He was a friend of everyone. If you had a problem, you could see him. These days, we have a market manager who we don't even know um, it's just some bods in the offices that run this place. As I say, the market superintendent was always very approachable, always came around to say good morning before he came to collect the rents. But no, these days it's a business run from up there. And we don't know any of them. I always got a cup of tea on the market when I came. <laughs> always. But there was a tea stall on the old market, I don't know if you remember there. There used to be a tea stall on there. Everybody used to go for a cup of tea there. Burkers, burkers. But the atmosphere was different. I mean, it wasn't run by the town hall. It was run by a market superintendent. And he did his job. And the market was just square the atmosphere. And then we had all these fruit stalls on the roadway. And the market was just packed. People were still buying at 7 o'clock at night. We used to have the old tilly lamps. The first time I went to an open market with a nice big hot mug of tea, it was winter, and a bacon butty in that hand. And that, that's my fondest memory, more than anything else. And I thought, this is the right. And then the outside market was great. We still have a laugh and a joke. They say, I've still got my 40-year-old sign there, Dirty Dick sign, all stolen property. I still get to laugh. And we try and run it like an outside market, although we're indoors. So I remember she's been very friendly right? behind the Savoy. Yes, I loved it at the open market, and it's not the same now, is yep. it? They're going to build an outside market here. It will never be the same as the old outside market. Oh, the atmosphere is brilliant. It, it always has been brilliant on the market. The atmosphere is very good on the market.
I don't know why, but I think you've torn the heart of the town when you move. <laughs> Market Hall and the colourful street stalls have disappeared forever, and you can't help feeling that a lot of the character has died with it, perished in the flames of progress. It seems that not only time is marching on, the traders here at St Helen's Market are also being asked to march on yet again for redevelopment. They're having to move to temporary accommodation a hundred yards away to enable a new market to be built. There, they'll have to set up at the start of each day and at closing time be required to remove the whole contents of their stall as the council cannot guarantee security to market traders. They want to move us over onto the uh, multi-storey car park. Well, no, a lot of the traders here are not geared up for that. They need vans. Some of us, I could manage over there, but lots of them can't manage over there. We're changing. We're in near the year 2000 and you're never going to get they're going to build an outside market here. It will never be the same as the old outside market because everybody's changing. We're all changing. Nobody wants to go in the car park over there, do they? A multi-storey car park. This is the problem now. The new market will be all right when we get it done, but where are they going to put us? In a car park? Outside the, outside the indoor market, um, to the one behind the Savoy, to the one over on the... Hotties, which is now the multi-storey car park, into St Mary's and into here. So it's been a long road. When the mistakes of the 1970s redevelopment are put right through demolition and rebuilding, the traders will be invited back to the new purpose-built facility. The town centre by that time will also have the added attraction of a new department store. Sadly, some traders have been frightened off by the daunting prospect of this massive upheaval and have pulled down the shutters on their businesses for good, and many of the market's older stallholders have gone. A familiar sight around St Helens, Pilkington fiberglass lorries trundling in and out of their Borough Road transport depot on a daily basis. Company restructuring and streamlining at Pilkington's meant that by 1986 the depot was closed and the red and cream loft insulation carriers disappeared, although the fiberglass operation continues with present owners Owens Corning at Ravenhead. Pilkington Fiberglass Transport Depot has been turned into the Shire's housing development. Although part of a house at Peasley Cross gave way to the humble origins of the cottage hospital there in 1873, there wasn't a hospital in St Helens until 1884, when on September the 15th, Hardshaw Hall, which had been donated by the Cotton family, was opened by Cardinal Manning as the Providence Hospital. The Roman Catholic Order of Nuns, the poor servants of the Mother of God, who were to run the hospital, had previously been nursing from 1882 at a house in George Street, later to become a gents hairdresser's. The building is still standing today, Those who attended the hospital from the early 1950s will have no doubt encountered the nurse who went on to earn folklore status, Sister Duffy. Oh yes, well, you always had such an awful lot of, uh, such a lot of people about that needed treatment and so on. And uh, well, with regard to um, things <laughs> like saying, um, pulling a plaster off quickly. Well, it hurt less by doing it that way than if you did a little bit and a little bit. It was all the little pa little bits of pain going along, whereas you would just finish with it in a minute uh, and that. Uh, but um, talking to her, I didn't feel for them, but you couldn't, if you wanted to stop to be feeling for people, you'd never get on, you'd never get any work done. But that didn't stop them from coming back again. They, they, they reappeared again and again and again, so it, it wasn't have been that bad. By January 1977, 
cuts in spending were beginning to take their toll at the Providence, as amid a storm of protest, the 16-bed children's ward closed after the area health authority slashed £67,000 grant aid. I got back from my holidays, a friend of mine called around to see me and he said, uh, did you hear about the, the hospital? And I said, no, what about it? And he said, it's closing in um, 1981. Now this must have been 79 maybe. The depression that came over me at that minute, you know, you, you feel fed up and browned off when you're coming back off a holiday, but then to have that to confront in you as well, uh, I thought to myself, well, that's awful. What chances did we have and what chances was there of carrying on with it? And then the people of the town then decided that they would like to keep it on and work very hard to do that. And um, we could appreciate that, but it was something really that really couldn't go on because it was an awful lot to expect a town to produce a to um, half a million a year to keep it going. Despite fundraising, which has almost become a series of weekly events, the probby failed to beat faceless bureaucracy and a team of accountants decided that a guillotine rather than a lifeline should be introduced. The Providence was, said it was going to close and that they uh, formed a committee to raise money to help it uh, to go on. And they had um, lots of things, different pubs and clubs and every, everybody around the, the town really put their backs into helping and trying to keep it open and that no other town in this, this country would have done what the people of this town did to try and raise money and to get the, and to keep it going. I mean, they're doing the same thing now with everywhere. Uh, every town and every hospital in the, in the country now has been uh, scaled down or closed or whatever, but just that we happen to be the first. The Slimline Survival Plan, closing two wards and axing 38 jobs after government funding had been withdrawn in 1981, was to make little difference. In June 1983, Sister Maria and Sister Ambrosia waved their last goodbyes. And by October of the same year, the bulldozers had finished their work. The struggle to survive for the prov was over.
probably the town's oldest resident to voice its opinion to more than 76,000 families each week, is the St. Helens newspaper, The Reporter. It's been bringing news reports to us since 1859. In 1877, John Culshaw moved his head office to St. Helens. The first time the paper appeared as the St. Helens Reporter, however, was in 1888, printed and published by Culshaw & Co. at 23 New Marketplace. By 1894, the St. Helens Standard and St. Helens Chronicle had been acquired by the reporter, and in October 1896, Culshaw & Co. moved to more commodious and central premises at 3 Hardshaw Street. A new company, the St. Helens & Prescott Reporter, was formed in 1897, but later met with problems and in 1906 went into liquidation. A new limited company was soon formed with Mr. W.G. Gentry appointed as editor to the newspaper. In November 1906, the reporter, in its new premises at 73 Church Street, told its readers, be sure you get your reporter on Friday. It will mark a new era of journalism, boasting 96 columns for a penny. The lease at the Church Street premises, due for expiry on December the 31st, 1958, meant the reporter looking for a new home, as the owners wouldn't extend the lease. The Hardshaw Bakery in College Street was secured, and after spending a colossal £80,000 on rebuilding and refitting, the Mayor, Councillor Rex Winter, opened the new office and works. Guests at the opening ceremony were eager readers of the special souvenir edition as it came off the press at the rate of 30,000 copies an hour. By 1961, and with the acquisition of more local newspapers, it was felt that the name of the company didn't reflect sufficiently the wide interests of the organisation, and in March of the same year, changed its name to South Lancashire Newspapers. The reporter by now had a circulation of 33,000 a week. The mid-70s brought revolutionary changes to the printing works in College Street, as the huge linotype setting machines were phased out with the introduction of photo composition. The St. Helens Star was launched in summer 1973. After agreeing to disagree with managing director Billy Gentry, Malcolm Smith, then advertising manager, left the reporter, taking with him other members of staff, to begin the town's first free newspaper. In 1978, Patsy Gentry, daughter of Billy, took over as managing director, staying with the company until 1991, when the title was sold to United Newspapers. Shortly afterwards, College Street was seen to be too far from the town centre. It was closed and a more central location became the new home for the reporter, with Terry McGee, its present editor. Will the market trader's move prove successful? Is there a place for markets for today's modern shopper in the age of supermarkets and self-service? Can we hope to have our own St. Helens cinema again? Will Lowy's go back to being the plaza? Will the real pie eaters please stand up? We can't look into the future, but we can always peep in the past.
Thank you very much.